how do you know that you've gotten to a place with the way you've designed your model that this really is something that will work well in the real world? When you say you have a constraint on budget or something like that, that is very succinctly and very much declared um, in the model. Yeah, mathematical optimization is really just about modeling logic via algebra. <laughs> um, and and uh, that, that's sort of where the, the art of it more or less uh, uh, rests is, is being able to take those business problems that people are just verbally telling you and then you say, okay, uh, I understand what you're saying and then you translate it into some algebra and then you translate that algebra into code. Jerry, welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you here. You were here not that long ago. So you were in episode number 723, which aired in October of 2023. So less than a year ago. And we had to have you back on the show because that episode, much more so than almost it might be, it's hard to, it's very hard to do one of these things where you're like more than any other episode. I don't know. It's, there's hundreds of episodes, but it's certainly up there in one of the top percentiles of episodes that completely blew my mind because we talked for over an hour about mathematical optimization and how useful of a tool it is in data science alongside approaches like statistics and machine learning. It's this completely other kind of tool <laughs> that you could yep. be leveraging to solve yep. specific kinds of problems that you're not solving optimally if you're trying mm -hmm. to use one of those other kinds of approaches. So wanted to have you back on and dig in in even more detail today. Welcome back to the show. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, I'm calling in from good old Vienna, Virginia, which is uh, just outside Washington, DC. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, uh, something that we talked about during your appearance last time uh, that gave me a really a really crystal clear idea of mathematical optimization was this thing called the burrito optimization game. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and so anybody listening right now, they can go to burrito.garobi.com and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And it allows you to, uh, to play in this fictitious world where you're setting up burrito carts uh, around like commercial areas, different parts of a town, and you're trying mm -hmm. to place the burrito trucks in the optimal locations to maximize your profit. And exactly. so that scenario illustrates for me, if anybody's wondering, when do I need mathematical optimization? You can just head, to, head there. It's a free thing you can try out. You just create a login. And then you can play around with it as much as you like. And it provides a really clear sense of when mathematical optimization is the ideal technique for a data science problem, because there are so many constraints in the problem. So there are, um, you know, there's, you can have any number of trucks. You can uh, place them in lots of different locations. There are different kinds of weather scenarios. Um, there, you know, there are these kinds of external factors, all of these things can be modeled, but are a lot, but, but provide a lot of, um, specific constraints, um, where you might not want to fit just any kind of number like you would with say a regression model, but where there's some range of specific values that are reasonable because, you know, you can't have negative trucks. You can't have more trucks than you have in your yeah. inventory to be able to send out. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about in a little bit more detail, maybe that like the burrito game and some other kind of example that mm -hmm. recaps for our listeners, uh, some of the content that we covered in that preceding episode number 723 before we get on to some new material. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the burrito optimization game is, is something that, um, we really feel is, is a great sort of way just to dive in to, to understanding optimization and, and, uh, Sort of two of the things that that I think really are illustrated there is one is is the this addition of of constraints to decision making and that's again like the main difference between uh, mathematical optimization what it does versus much of what machine learning uh, does is is the predictive nature versus the prescriptive nature you know uh, mathematical optimization is prescriptive it sort of falls in this decision intelligence umbrella at least that's where where we feel it fits so it's all about more about decision making as opposed to understanding the future so 
so when you have these sort of business rule constraints things, those are things that restrict your decisions more or less than, than anything else. And, and in addition to that, the sort of the uh, combinatorial complexity of the decisions, and, and that's something that is, is really highlighted in the burrito optimization game, where you have a, a fixed number of, of places where you can place a burrito truck to feed people lunch. And um, your decision as a decision maker is like a yes, no, do I place a truck here? So that's what we call a, a binary decision variable. I can talk a little bit more about why those are super useful a little bit later. But uh, but uh, one thing that, that I like to, to think about is like, let's take that sort of a, a decision space like that. That's what we call, you know, the the possible the possibilities of what you can decide is, is a decision space or a feasible region. Those are some of the terminal some of the terminology that that we use. Um, if you have forty yes no decisions, that turns out to be um, I had the number in front of me. It turns out to be something like uh, the the number of possibilities is I think like uh, one point one times ten to the eleventh. Just forty yes no decisions. All you know, do I have all of them? Yes, all of them. No, what all the possibilities in between? Ten to the eleventh, um, or sorry, maybe it's ten to the twelfth. Um, and if you <laughs> it's take, a, it's a huge number. Yeah, yeah, incomprehensibly it, large number either. Exactly, way. and and to to bring that number into perspective a little bit, um, if you were to take the distance from Earth to the Sun in feet, that's still less, about half. It's about half. Uh, so that's that's the that's the ten to the eleventh, and ten to the twelfth is is the number of possibilities for forty yes no decisions. So just that little like forty yes nos. So if you have forty spots on that burrito map, and the, your your question is, do I want to place a truck there? Yes or no? That's already more complex than the you know the number of possibilities is is greater than the the distance from Earth to Sun in feet. So that's like that's pretty crazy. So um, so understanding that sort of complexity, that, that just vastness of decisions. Cause if you're like, Oh, well, I'll just, I'll just enumerate through all these, just plow right through it and, and, and figure out which one of these is, is the best, you know, then good luck, you know, um, the, the, the earth will probably be, you know, long and exploded or something <laughs> by the time your, 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 uh, laptop is done running that. Um, so, so yeah, so that's something that, that really bring that the optimization game, Brito optimization game really brings home is holy, crap, there's a lot of options here. Um, and it's just for a very, very simple game of dragging trucks and it's fun. It's interactive and everything like that. And then you get more, uh, complex with, with, you know, uh, different scenarios where it's, um, cause people walk to your truck and you see them sort of filing out of little buildings to your trucks and everything like that. And, and um, okay, well, what if I slightly move a truck over here? And you sort of see the nuance of decision making and, and everything. And it's just, um, yeah, it just sort of really drives home uh, the, the complexity of what types of problems people try and solve. And again, I was talking about like 40 binary variables, 40 yes, no decisions. In in practice, when you go to you know, and and what, is, what people are using out there in the world of, of business decision making and mathematical optimization, what people really use this for is you know the number of decision variables is you know thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, even tens of millions for some you know. Um, so you're having all of that just massive, massive decision making capability, sort of very distinctly uh modeled um and and just you know be able to to click go more or less and 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 uh, use a tool like aerobi to help uh sort of plow through those decisions instead of enumerating them and sort of saying which one's the best you know uh our special sauce solver <laughs> um that 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 uh plows through those decisions plows through those options in a super smart way um and and says this is you know this is the decision that will uh give you the most profit for this uh, for this problem or or the least cost or or doing things in the most uh fair way um some you know 
a bunch of different types of, of, of uh, objectives that you can try and, and model here. And, and uh, the burrito optimization game just really talks about, you know, maximizing profit, but you know, there's a lot of utility that it can be maximized or a lot of fairness and, and, um, and, and things of that nature as well. So um, yeah, it's, it, it's just a, it's just a great tool. I'm super pumped that, that we were able to get this going uh, last year. Um, and we use it for a lot of uh, events, and it's just a great way to to understand optimization. Um, the one thing that I do want to be it, it's it's mathematical optimization. While it's great for that problem, it's great for so many other problems too. So I don't want everyone to to do optimization this to play this game and think, well, I'm not putting burrito trucks on streets, so I'm going to do something else. <laughs> no, no, no. You can use it for a, a whole bunch. You know, uh, I think last time I talked about all the different industries. Um, different use cases, you know, scheduling um, and and supply chain stuff are sort of like our bread and butter. The logistics, that's where um, and and like you know, uh, there, there's a lot of um, chemical mixing, like gas and oil companies use uh, optimization a lot for for that type of stuff. But uh, but you know, we're into you know financial tools, finance um, and healthcare stuff. It, it's just sort of, we're all over the place. So um, if you're thinking, well, I'm in this industry, I want to know if optimization could be, could be good for me. Like go onto our website, look at the use cases, um, try, you know, ask chat GPT, you know, Hey, is this a good thing for optimization? Um, and, uh, and it'll probably be like, yeah, because <laughs> it is it is uh useful for pretty much for for a lot of uh decision making you know uh decision making problems so ready to take your knowledge in machine learning and ai to the next level join super data science and access an ever-growing library of over 40 courses and 200 hours of content from beginners to advanced professionals super data science has tailored programs just for you including content on large language models gradient boosting and ai with 17 unique career paths to help you navigate the courses, you will stay focused on your goal. Whether you aim to become a machine learning engineer, a generative AI expert, or simply add data skills to your career, Super Data Science has you covered. Start your 14-day free trial today at superdatascience.com. Yeah, real-world practical decision-making problems across, mm -hmm. as you mentioned there, things like scheduling, supply chain, logistics, finance, healthcare, chemical mixing. Those are kinds of common use cases Mm -hmm. but it could be any industry. The key thing, I think, for situations where you want to be using mathematical optimization is that there's some kind of outcome that you're trying to maximize or minimize. And mm -hmm. I guess that is also something that's different about when you think about, you made the distinction at the outset between making predictions, like predicting the future versus being prescriptive. Mm -hmm. And with something that's prescriptive like this, you're you're not taking necessarily a bunch of historical data and just trying to say, oh, you know, if, if my inputs happen to be these inputs, what am I going to get? What you're doing with this kind of prescriptive approach with this mathematical optimization that Garobi offers is that you are saying, how can I maximize, given these constraints, mm -hmm. how can I maximize some outcome or minimize some outcome? So how can I maximize profits or how can I minimize delivery time? And then, as you mentioned there, what you call the secret sauce, the key thing that Garobi is offering is that, I guess, kind of figuring out what your full optimization space is. That can be hard, but it's not the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing is then being able to explore over that space, which, as you mentioned, in the real world, it could be millions of possible decision points that could be binary or mm -hmm. continuous. And so the key, the secret sauce is this Garobi solver that can then, in a lot of situations, work extremely rapidly at optimally solving, approvably optimally, if I uh, exactly. remember correctly. That, that it's is not, it. this isn't an approximation of what the maximum mm -hmm. profit would be or the minimum delivery time. It's like, it's uh, mathematically proven to be the, the maximum or the minimum, mm -hmm. whatever you're looking for. And it typically happens uh, rapidly, at least, you know, in my hands-on experiences with it. And critically, it's easy to access through, say, Python. Um, mm -hmm. So you've provided lots of, and we'll provide links in the show notes, to lots of Jupyter notebooks and tutorials that you've created to allow people to be accessing the Groby optimizer through Python code. Exactly. 
Yeah, and the yeah the uh, what you're saying about how you know the the, the constraint part of it is a huge thing um, and makes things very very difficult. Um, and again, like the this requirement for binary decision variables for integer decision variables, like if you're making if you're building cars, you know you can't build half of a car. So it may be very very uh, important that you're that you're deciding things in integer quantities. So um, yeah, those are. Um, a couple of the a couple of the key things that sort of differentiate mathematical optimization from something that you would do purely like calculus based, and you have like oh I have some curve and I want to find you know the you know, maximum or minimum of it so oh, why don't I just take a couple of derivatives and bada bing bada boom I'm done uh, you know stuff like that it, it um, while those methods sort of are incorporated in some things but um, it's it, it is it differentiates from that because of uh, uh, all of those restrictions and the constraints and, and the, the ideas that we, you know, well, if I'm, you know, a binary decision variable, something like, you know, yes, no, do I want to open a, do I want to open a warehouse in the city? You know, well, if I, you can ha then have like, if then it's like, if I open a warehouse in this city, then I shouldn't open another warehouse within 200 miles. Cause why would right. I do that? So then you right. can build that logic into the model and say, and, and then say, okay, well, if I build any, any location, I build a warehouse or any location that I put a burrito truck, I do not want to put another warehouse or whatever truck within a certain distance because it just doesn't make sense or because of any other business reasons that you, that you may, uh, have, you know, um, that you may know of yourself or people may be sort of telling you, this is the way we need to do things. Then, then you just, it, it's, yeah, mathematical optimization is really just about modeling logic via algebra. <laughs> um, and and uh, that, that's sort of where the, the art of it more or less uh, uh, rests is, is being able to take those business problems that people are just verbally telling you. And then you say, okay, uh, I understand what you're saying. And then you translate it into some algebra and then you translate that algebra into code. And Python is our, by and large, our most popular um, API, uh, and and it's it's really really good. Um, not just saying that as an employee, but as someone who used it before joining, um, and and everything uh, that it's it, it is great. Um, it, it just makes everything so just makes that whole process uh, pretty seamless. Um, and, and and yeah, that's the that's why mathematical optimization as a whole, I think, is is it's different. Be from machine learning because of that. It, it you modeling business logic is not something that machine learning does. If your data does not contain these cases that ha have happened, then you're sort of blind. First off, <laughs> um, and even if it does, what the outcomes were, what the decisions were, all the other things that that uh, have that can influence like such a regression. Let's say, like how do you know that things were being you know it, it's it's uh, it, just relying purely on past data is, is not the is not the approach because what if the past was you know things have changed there's underlying uh, just so many underlying like uh, things that have changed particularly you know if you think of you know uh, pre COVID during COVID post COVID type of things um, uh, so events like that just sort of destroy predictive models because how can you predict what's going to happen during uh, you know, a, a once in a generation sort of uh, outbreak when it's once in a generation, how much data do you have on that? You know, but uh, something like mathematical optimization, when you're describing the logic of a system, sort of like a supply chain network or a schedule or, or how I want to invest in, in um, a portfolio of stocks or something like that, like that logic stays the same independent among, you know, uh, even, you know, you may want to say, okay, um, we're in a pandemic now. I want to be more conservative. Well, you can then sort of, I want to be more conservative with how I how I invest or something like that. Then you can really model that with logic, and you can, uh, as opposed to relying on underlying data to make some decisions about that. That's also not to say that these two things shouldn't work together. They definitely do, um, and and that's sort of my main message as yeah. as someone. You mean the, yeah. the two things being machine learning and mathematical optimization? Precisely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, like they, you, you should not be like I, I. I feel it should be very very rare case in which you build an optimization model in which the numbers that you use there, that that go into it are not uh, not provided by some sort of machine learning 
uh, process or some sort of intense, rigor, rigorous data analytics process, be it machine learning, be it statistics, be it just, you know, really crunching some numbers and coming up with a mean of some sort, an average, you know, that could be fine, but, but it should be, there should be a lot of information that goes into that, but it's just, but mathematical optimization itself does not rely on vast amount of underlying data. Very cool. Other than Python, what are other APIs? You mentioned Python is the most popular API, but what other options are there out there? Uh, if you're into C, we got, uh, it's, uh, we have that, uh, java.net. Um, I'm an, I'm an avid R user. I love R. Um, so you can use that as well. Um, pretty much any way that you do, uh, your work, it's, uh, it, it'll be there as well. So, um, we, we definitely make sure that we are, uh, very accessible to, to anyone. Nice. We don't do as many R episodes probably as we should, because whenever we do, they're very popular. I don't know if you heard in episode number 779 back in April, we had Hadley Wickham on the show. I did not see that one. Uh, it's one worth checking out for all okay. you R lovers out there. It's all about R <laughs> because it's Hadley Wickham. It's pretty funny in the episode. I kind of have my own biases. I I became a quote unquote data scientist before that was a uh, term mm -hmm. using R and have since made the migration to Python and mostly end up using Python and so even in this Hadley Wickham interview, talking to a guy who has developed many of the mm -hmm. most widely used R libraries, yeah. uh, even to him, I'm kind of like, so, <laughs> you know, how often do you use Python and that kind of stuff? And he's like, never. <laughs> I mean, that's my, his whole shtick is, yeah. you know, taking functionality uh, or capabilities that are in Python and, and bringing them over to R, um, making sure that it, it is as performant on anything mm -hmm. as as Python. Um, and also, so coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, I'm anticipating episode number 817 will be with Julia Silgi, who is an iconic R author, specifically on natural language processing oh, awesome. with R. So that'll be a cool one for people to check out. Uh, anyway, I digress. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Python is the most popular API, but you mentioned also there's C, Java, .NET, R. And a critical thing to mention here is that despite, you know, prior to our our episode last year, Jerry, I hadn't really heard of Garobi. Uh, it, it wasn't something that, that was in my consciousness. But since then, I see Garobi all over the place. And I hear people talking about Garobi all over the place. And so, uh, and, and that is because people who work particularly in a corporate setting, like at a Fortune 500 company, I... If I remember correctly, it was something like 80% of Fortune mm -hmm. 500, company, 500 companies use a Garobi optimizer. And so while it isn't something that, you know, unlike R or MATLAB or Python, which are these kinds of, of programming languages or toolkits that you tend to learn about in university, as far as I'm aware, Garobi isn't, you know, it, you don't have that many kind of data scientists coming up with Garobi as part of their education. But if they're working at a big corporate that needs to be solving these big mm -hmm. complex problems, there's a really good chance you are using Garobi at one of those companies. They, yeah, it, it is one of those uh, sort of secret things. Um, and actually, we just uh, every so often we we dive into the fortune lists and 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 compare the customers to our customers to to that. So this is um, so we actually just have recent update stats, and I, I will uh, rattle them off here. Um, so of the top 500, uh, Fortune 500, 35%, uh, once you get up to 250, and notice the trend here, when you get up to 250, 43%, top 100 is 51%, top 10 is 80%. Right. So, right, right. So, That's where I got my 80% from. 80% yeah. of Fortune 10. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it, we, mathematical optimization, and particularly Groby, where we are everywhere in a sense, um, but it's just, it's typically hidden in some application that you, that you, that you may use. And you just never know that you're, that, that you're, that you're using Groby because we are, we are the, the engine to the car, more or less. If, mm -hmm. if your decision problem is the car, then we are the engine that, that, that makes it go. But you don't really care about the engine. You hop in, you turn the key and you go and you go from point mm -hmm. A to point B. And, and uh, so you don't really worry about it. So you, 
you, if, if you think about something like Google Maps and it gives you, uh, okay, go for, to get from point A to point B here, you should take this road and it's going to be, this is the quickest time or the shortest distance or the most fuel efficient. Um, there's optimization there and you just don't even know that you're using it. Um, so, uh, and that's another example of, of different types of objectives that you can have in, in, math, in mathematical optimization. Do I want minimum carbon footprint? Do I want uh, carbon, you know, uh, put out there? Do I want minimum distance, minimum toll costs, all, all these sort of things anyways. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's so many ways that, that in which mathematical optimization is there. If you schedule a delivery from any sort of massive, one of the, the larger carriers or, or anything like that. And, and they say, okay, well, your package is going to arrive, you know, at this time, there's a pretty good chance that some optimization went into that to, to help you, to help them figure out what's the way that they can get you your, whatever you just purchased, get it to you as quickly as possible, but also in a cost efficient way for them. So, uh, so those are the types of things in which optimization is there and, and it's there, uh, uh, everywhere. And that's sort of what we, um, what part of our, uh, Garobi's message for the upcoming, like, uh, you know, sort of our, our, I guess our, we, we call it Garobi 2.0 in, in a, internally and kind of externally, I guess, but, um, but just that optimization is everywhere. And we're just trying to highlight where it is and how you can use it and how you can use. And again, we, we believe our, our solver is the best out there. And, and, uh, thinking that, that if you do have such problems, uh, then, then Groby might be the way to go. But um, overall, I think um, if if people come away here thinking that mathematical optimization and not you know get, remove the Groby thing from it, just if that mathematical optimization is something that I should learn, then then uh, I, I feel it's a success today. Eager to learn about large language models and generative AI, but don't know where to start? Check out my comprehensive two-hour training, which is available in its entirety on YouTube. Yep, that means not only is it totally free but it's ad-free as well. It's a pure educational resource. In the training, we introduce deep learning transformer architectures and how these enable the extraordinary capabilities of state-of-the-art LLMs. And it isn't just theory. My hands-on code demos, which feature the Hugging Face and PyTorch Lightning Python libraries, guide you through the entire life cycle of LLM development, from training to real-world deployment. Check out my generative AI with large language models hands-on training today on YouTube. We've got a link for you in the show notes. Nice. And so if we have listeners out there who, you know, write Python code or write R code, and they want to be getting started on using Garobi or mathematical optimization on some real world business problem that they have today, how hard is it for them to, like, to set up the problem? So we talked about how, you know, the hardest part of this is having the optimizer work efficiently. Garobi handles that for us automatically under the covers. But the thing that is bespoke and different for every circumstance, for every business problem, is figuring out how to set that up in our code. And so how tricky is that? How, like, how often can somebody do that on their own versus needing to, say, you know, engage with a consultant that is, is expert at this kind of stuff? To model like the hardest of hard problems out there, um, it does take some experience with anything. Um, it takes some understanding of... of how how these particular sets of constraints work and and again taking the logic that someone says or writes down and translating that into the sort of the algebra algebraic logic and then that into code um can be tricky um but um but there are some things that that specifically Garobi and and uh, other solvers and other platforms and things that that do you know what be they competitors or something um there is sort of shortcuts out there where you don't have to know all of this stuff and you don't have to understand all of it to its to you know down to its most minute detail. Um, so it, it is very easy to get started and it is easy to because um, it like our simple problems are extremely simple. Um, but then building on top of that, it's it's yeah, it's gonna take some understanding, it's gonna take a little bit of work, gonna take some research and and under you know, a lot of stack overflows, some uh, and uh, and things like that to to really get to um, a production level type of of, of model I, I'd say a, at a large scale. Um, but the journey there is, uh, and this is sort of one of the uh, hangups of of mathematical optimization in the past, 
is that you needed to ha have a PhD in order to make this journey from basic problem to actually doing something at scale for a business um, and, and making an impact. Now, it, that's not so that, that's not the case. Um, you can you can just be really good at coding and understanding logic and and you can make uh, you can have an impact and you can solve problems and you can provide solutions that that are really doing something. Um, and part of and that's part of why, why I, I, I joined Grobu is to help get those resources out there. And, you know, so I'm just going to talk about what, what, what we put out there a little bit, but there's a ton. I think I, I at the end of the last episode, I referenced uh, an optimization book that would be really, really good, again, to, um, uh, to, to dive into. But um, from, from our perspective, from things that we released, um, I did two, uh, two online training sessions um, that we called optimization for data scientists, Opti 101, Opti 201. So it was very, you know, the bare basics uh, of optimization and then some a more intermediate level. Um, the Opti 101 series you can find on our YouTube page. Um, and the Opti 201 is going to be on our YouTube page probably in the next uh, month or so. Um, and there's going to be an Opti, I think 202 is kind of how we're phrasing it or thinking about it internally, which is sort of more intermediate level stuff. Um, all of it has hands-on exercises, hands-on notebooks, uh, me looking at a camera just like this and talking to people for hours and hours, uh, making mistakes like everyone does. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, um, uh, and it's just a lot of fun. It's a great way to sort of just, um, to, to take a, a day or so to, to really get to, to really improve some skills. Um, and then we also have some, uh, recently launched, I think in April, something that's a lot more massive. Um, so on Udemy, we have um, uh, optimization through the lens of data science. It's a four part course. We teamed up with one of the best optimization minds um, out there, um, Dr. Joel Sokol from Georgia Tech. And uh, he, uh, walks you through uh, everything that you need to know about mathematical optimization from the absolute bare beginnings to uh, uh, to creating you know real models that again will will have real impact and how to and it just makes that 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 journey step by step by step very incremental nothing too crazy all in Python. Um, and and the, it, it then uh, weaves in his experiences and 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 everything um, with his consultancy stuff that he's worked on the side and stuff that he's he's done and and it's just it is a wonderful uh, way to to sort of set set yourself on the journey um, and again it's it's through the lens of data science so there's it's it's again saying how these two things really really work well together how they are super complementary um, and and it's a between those two things, um, I think you're 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 set. Um, but again, you between can do the, a lot. Yeah. Between the Opti 101 course that's mm -hmm. available on YouTube now, as well as the Udemy course that's yeah. that you know through the data science lens, we'll be sure to include links to both of those. Awesome. And I, I think we were saying like, uh, how can one person like make this make this journey? Again, I was talking about incremental um, sort of. Uh, sort of building upon, okay, I know this, now I know a little bit more and a little bit more, and a little bit more. Now I can actually get to something that, that makes a lot of, uh, of sense. When you're uh, that type of, so not just like that type of progress isn't just for learning optimization as a whole, but it's how you build a model. You start with a very basic premise, a very basic problem that someone talks to you about, and then you build a model and then you'll get a solution that makes no sense when you talk about it. And that's 100% expected and fine. You'll, it'll say, oh, you know, put all of your, you know, maybe we can talk about, you know, put one burrito truck here and it'll serve everybody and you'll make infinite, you know, uh, profit. And you'll be like, whoa, 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 that makes no sense. Oh, I forgot this type of constraint or I modeled something slightly wrong or something like that. It's just building a model within itself is iterative, not just learning how to do optimization mm. is iterative. So you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get weird answers. You're going to um, like mathematical optimization. I, I call it like, it's like the best cheater of all time. If you give it the smallest, like little opening to have infinite profit, it will find it. Right. Reward hacking to take the reinforcement learning terminology. 
Yeah, precisely. Yeah, it will. It will do that each and every time if it's possible. So, um, so yeah. So it's it's uh, uh, if you find yourself like sort of stumbling a little bit, like this doesn't make sense or this doesn't make sense. Why am I getting weird solutions or no solutions? Um, then that's perfectly normal. The best of the best of us still do that, <laughs> um, you know. And and uh, it is just part of the learning process. So how do you know, you talked about that iterative process and, you know, you can get some answers that make no sense. Like you gave the example there where you're playing, you know, you set up something like the burrito game and it tells you you can make an infinite amount of money by having one burrito truck that's serving everyone. And, you know, logically you can look at that and say, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when you've built a really poor model or there's some big hole that the optimizer can exploit, that you know, that, that kind of sounds like, okay, you can visually tell, you can logically tell this is a problem. How do you know that you've gotten to a place with the way you've designed your model, that this really is something that will work well in the real world? Cause you can mm -hmm. imagine maybe there's some intermediate models on the way there where to your eye, nothing seems awry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's where the, um, the, the process that I'm sort of talking about from like written word or verbal to to algebra to code, but that that first part is really really important because when you say you have a constraint on budget or something like that, that is very succinctly and very much declared um, in the model. So it is it is there, um, and and you once it's in that model, then it's guaranteed to be sort of uh, respected. So. If, if there is nothing that you can find in, in that translation, then you can feel very, very confident that what you're doing is representing your problem. So, so I mean, that, that is where that is, you know, I'm making it sound like it is kind of easy. It is, it can be very, very difficult to make sure that that happens because some of that logic that I'm talking about is very complex and it takes, you know, some experience, some understanding to really make sure that that happens. And, and there can be ways in which, you know, you think it's working and it doesn't. And, you know, you find out well after the fact that there is something that is kind of going awry. Um, and and uh, there is no like sort of silver bullet for that. I think it is it is experience. It is really understanding um, the system that you're modeling and what makes sense. Um, so, I, you know, so the, the burrito game making, you know, infinite pro profit. Obviously, that's the, that, that's a clear indication. But you know, maybe if you are someone who is in that business and really understands, um, you know, sort of uh, food service and and putting out, you know, uh, food trucks, uh, you know, and 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 sort of fleet management or something like that. From from that perspective, they may have something that they may understand something that that you didn't, and and then therefore saying, oh, this this kind of doesn't make sense. You should really add a constraint to make this happen or, you know, or something along those lines. So, um, so I would say that SME expertise, you know, subject matter expertise, um, on, on the actual problem that you're, that you're solving is, is probably the best thing to, to really make sure you understand that, that the solutions that you're getting are, are what you would, are in line with what you would expect. Mm-hmm. You mentioned earlier on about how when you're setting these things up, in addition to the kinds of tutorials you provided, the Jupyter Notebooks there, people might want to consult things like Stack Overflow. Now, that immediately, in my mind, jumped to today, how I am much less frequently using Stack Overflow. And for me, I'm usually using Claude by Anthropic, but there's also GPT-4.0 from OpenAI or Gemini from Google. These state-of-the-art LLMs have you used, uh, have you kind of like pair programmed um, with, with, with one of these LLMs on an optimization problem? Yes. Um, and I uh, do it a lot to see how well it works. <laughs> um, and, and actually, um, uh, we, we, that is something that I'm exploring with people internally. Um, we are putting together a, um, a custom GPT that, um, that will help with with some of this um and we're we're coming at it from a uh an educational perspective of this is going to help you understand optimization modeling um i i would not feel comfortable um putting anything copy pasting code and putting it into production and uh right now 
um, for anything, really. I mean, not just optimization, but anything, literally anything, any code generation that pops out for anything. I, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta do some, some checking on that. Same thing for, for mathematical optimization, but, um, but it does a surprisingly good job of, of, of making that logical connection from, from, pro- it, it, it is, there is like this, um, incredible parallel between how I was talking about someone states a decision problem and you need to translate it. That's exactly what, you know, uh, what, what you can do with all the, with all the tools that you're just talking about with, uh, and so you just give it a prompt and yeah, it'll do a really good job. There are things that, that it makes mistakes on there are, you know, um, and we are, uh, trying to understand those. And, uh, I think, it, it could be later this year. Um, we, we do plan on sort of doing like a webinar on that. Uh, it would be something that'll be really cool. Um, cause uh, yeah, again, I, I'm experimenting a lot with, with, um, some problems and we also have a couple other people who are, who are doing that. And, and, um, uh, part of, uh, Grobe's innovation is, uh, we had an internal innovation competition. So like everyone submitted ideas and, and things and like, and, and, uh, one of my colleagues was like, Hey, we should do modeling with, you know, with, with GBT. And like, everyone's like, yep, a hundred percent. That was like everyone, no, no, no other, uh, 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 problem or no other innovation project really came close. That was the clear winner. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's something that I a hundred percent think is a great idea. You just, you just need to take it with the proper grain of salt yeah, that yeah. you do with everything. Yeah. So, so for getting started, for educating yourself on how optimization problems work and how you can be integrating Garobi through the Python API or the R API uh, into your code, you know, having suggestions uh, from these top of the line, cutting edge LLMs like the, like I already mentioned, uh, Claw three point five, um, GPT four zero and Gemini from Google, it, I suspect it is similar to my experience with any of the coding that I do where, yeah, like you said, most of the time it doesn't make mistakes, but because it does sometimes make mistakes, you need to be sure that you understand what's going on in that code. You can't just copy paste and put it into production, like you said. And, and from, from our experience, the simple models um, we actually started benchmarking these too, like so, like our simple models from our Jupyter Notebook library, um, and it does super super simple models extremely well. Like you can set it and forget it for that. And then once you get to like intermediate, then there's a it's like a coin flip whether or not there'll be an error. And then complex models. Right now, um, we've seen some improvement, but um, uh, th- there's just some some things that it just. It, particularly once you start talking about like abstract ideas, like um, one that we had a little bit of a problem with, but actually recently saw some improvement is um, uh, a 3D tic-tac-toe type of type of game. Like, okay, can you do this, you know, in, in um, minimal, like filling in minimal number of lines in order to, to, to do something like, I think it's filling in the, 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 the 3D board um, with minimal number of uh, like, uh, three, you know, connecting three X's in a row or three O's in a row, um, doing that. Uh, and we had some problems with like the, just the abstract nature of, of that problem just didn't really translate well. Um, so, I mean, yeah, th- th- there are some things, th- there are some problems, but, um, yeah, always, always verify. Nice. All right. So on the topic of LLMs, <laughs> uh, companies like NVIDIA have had explosions in their share price because GPUs are (laughs) critical to efficiently training any kind of deep learning model and the larger they get. So huge LLMs like the ones I just mentioned, you know, GPT-4 kind of class Mm -hmm. models, LOD3 class models, Google Gemini, these are gigantic. You're going to need many GPUs to train over. And so the most cutting edge, like H100, NVIDIA GPUs are in really high demand because if you want to be training the next generation of LLM from scratch, you're going to need the absolutely most cutting edge hardware. Um, and so these um, these kinds of processors, GPUs, they build on the same kind of, like they're called graphics processing units because they mm-hmm. originally were for rendering 3D graphics and things like video games or when you're doing video editing on your computer. And the same kind of simple matrix multiplication 
that is critical to doing that kind of graphics rendering also turns out to be the kind of highly parallelizable, simple computation that we need for training or even at inference time with deep learning models. And, and as I already said, as they get really big like LLMs, the more and more critical mm -hmm. having uh, GPUs becomes. If you tried to train an LLM on CPUs from scratch, <laughs> it would, like you, you gave the example of uh, Earth exploding or maybe yeah. our sun going nova um, before, before yeah. you would have your model trained. So, um, so a question that I have for you is, is like how does mathematical optimization relate to the kind of device that we're training on, like a CPU or a GPU? So, uh, so for the question of you know GPUs, like why you know hey, GPUs are are the cutting edge for everything. Is it is that the same thing for mathematical optimization? So the the answer to that is no. <laughs> it, it's not it's not the right it's not the right tool for the right job. Which was uh, something that I harped on I think last episode. Um, you know, choosing the right tool for the right job for decision problems. Well, for this, um, it's just the GPUs again, uh, John, as we were saying, um, you know, massive parallelization, um, simple operations. That's just not what the algorithms that we have for mathematical optimization. Those are, are not, <laughs> uh, are not like that. They're not, they're not hyper parallelizable. They're not, um, not providing simple computations. Um, by and large, so it's if you do try and right now, if you try and and uh, run typical mathematical optimization algorithms, which I can talk a little bit more about those um, in a little bit, sort of high level, and on, on what goes on there. But if you try and do that, then it's just it's it's not the right fit, um, and it, you'll you'll suffer um, some performance uh, issues there. Um, there is one little exception in, in, um, matrix factorization is a very important part of, uh, one of the types of, of algorithms that's used. Um, and that's something that, um, that can be done pretty well, um, uh, on GPUs. So, so there is some, some hope, um, and it is something that, that the team Garobi and, uh, other folks are, are trying to look into. We're always, um, we're always looking for the best way out there to to run what we want to run to solve the problems that we that we like to solve. So um, if at one one point um, GPUs are the uh, are the uh, way to go, then then that's the way that we're going to go. So it's that being said, yeah, CPU uh, is is the is the way to go. Um, but um, one interesting thing that I do want to mention about um, particularly with 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 Nvidia um, is they. Uh, uh, actually, um, through a customer, through through something, <laughs> through through the fates that be, um, came uh, and sort of knocked on our door, and we're like, we heard you have really hard computational problems for CPUs. And we're like, yes, we do. Um, so they um, wanted us to test out uh, their uh, Grace CPU um, on on the problems that mathematical optimization solves, and and, and use Garobi. And um, so um, my one of my close uh, colleagues, we call him the mad scientist, uh, Greg Glockner, who is um, a VP technical fellow at, at Garobi, has been uh, working um, at Garobi for, I think he was like employee like three or four or something like that. Um, he is, he, he's, he's, uh, he's number one in my book. Um, but uh, he, uh, he did a lot of testing with other folks on, on our side and um, using their CPU compared to like sort of like the established um, AMD processors that, that, that we that we typically use um, for benchmarking. Um, we found a 23% improvement on like hard problems um, while using 46% less energy. So like that type of improvement, like, hey, that's a pretty, pretty impressive improvement from from a, a speed perspective, but from an energy consumption perspective, that was it was something that was really interesting to, to see. So um, so it's uh, so the CPU um, uh, environment for us is, is still we're still improving. There's still cool things happening out there. Um, and uh, from a so from a uh, I guess a. Uh, computational uh, perspective of like, all right, how like how much faster is this stuff getting over time? Like, are you guys reaching a plateau? You know, is the hardware reaching a plateau? Is the are the algorithms sort of slowing down? Um, 
the answer to both of those is not not really. Um, and as I sort of just talking about, like there's there is still room for CPU perform performance um, uh, improvements there. There's there's room for energy um, improvements, um, energy consumption improvements, and um, and what we work on is the algorithmic improvements as well. And uh, sort of I actually just ran across this this slide from uh, that we have for presentations uh, just earlier today. Um, from version 11, which was released uh, last November, to comparing that to like our earliest versions, um, we are uh, the Groby solver, like independent of of hardware, is 80 times faster. So, you know, so if you think about that, 80 times faster than we were, you know, like 10 years ago, plus all of the crazy um, hardware improvements, processing improvements. That on top of that, I mean, you're solving problems like thousands times faster than you used to be. So stuff that would take, you know, oh, this would take like a day to solve or take like a week, you know, solving in minutes and seconds now. So you're so so that's part of like what what we want to get out there in the into the world as part of our message is, hey, yeah, CPUs like processors are awesome and they're getting better. We got really smart people and we bring more on. Uh, you know, year after year, we're, we're expanding our our, our teams and, and and bring in the best of the best. Our algorithms are getting better because of that. Problems that like you would just not even think about solving five years ago are solvable in minutes now. Um, and and so it's and that is a key thing that 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 people are that was a common uh, sort of misconception of mathematical optimization is. Well, it's 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 too hard. It's too complex of a problem to solve. The computational stuff is just don't don't even worry about it. And we're like, hey, you know, at some point, yes, you can make problems infinitely large, and yeah, it's not going to solve. Okay, but you can still get real business results, real solve real problems at the scale that you want, and and it's it's doable. So um, so that's part of my uh, part of my spiel part of my uh, getting on my soapbox is, is that. Well, what's really interesting about this whole conversation that you just had is that I was only vaguely aware that NVIDIA was working on CPUs at all. It's like, now that you say that, it's something that I'm kind of able to, like, there's some cobwebby memories out there, but this is the first time with, so the blog post that you provided, authored by Greg Glockner, whom you mentioned earlier from Garobi, that uh, VP and technical fellow at Garobi, I will be including in the show notes a link to this blog post, which is super interesting because it's going into so much detail on NVIDIA's CPUs, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which like, yep. and yeah, it's got it right in here, as you mentioned, compared to the AMD chip that I guess you would typically be using, it's 23% faster and uses 46% less energy. So effectively half the amount of energy, which when you think about the scale that these things can be implemented on, even just work that Groby is doing mm -hmm. for its greater than 1,000 clients, something like 1,200 clients that you guys have um, around the world. And so that kind of cost savings is is uh, yeah. is gigantic and energy savings is gigantic. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, as, a, as a company who preaches like, hey, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, you, know, you want to reduce costs, use a mathematical optimization. Uh, if you want to reduce costs, you know, um, then there are things out there that can help that, that can help uh, run our product and other uh, other similar things faster and, and, and more efficiently. Yeah, and that's just reading some more details about this, this Grace CPU from NVIDIA, it has 72 cores <laughs> and 480 gigs of high performance, mm -hmm. low power memory. So that's, that's wild. I mean, that it's kind of taking the same kind of philosophy, I suppose, that NVIDIA has had historically with parallelization lots of memory, high-speed mm -hmm. memory transfer. So that kind of expertise that they have around developing the world's by far most popular yeah. GPUs, AI uh, inference accelerators, taking that same kind of expertise and now applying it to CPUs, making chips that have tons of cores and tons of memory. Cool. Great story there. Um, in addition to new hardware options, like being able to use those kinds of CPUs, uh, you mentioned things like an ADX speed up for the Groby uh, software, like just the way that the Groby optimizer is implemented, you get ADX speed up. So if hardware hadn't changed over the last 10 years, you'd still enjoy that ADX speed up because of more clever, mm -hmm. um, more clever work on the software side of the optimizer. So 
Um, can you tell us more about new optimizer versions that you have and maybe go into more detail on how the main algorithms work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, what we've at Groby have been sort of diving into uh, a lot over the last couple years is um, if you look at what MIP stands for at MIP, that's mixed integer programming, but there's an implicit L there. And the L is for linear, mixed integer linear programming. So everything needs to be linear or it should be linear. It's very helpful if it's linear. Um, so your constraints need to be you know, linear functions. Your objective needs to be a linear function um, for that. This reminds me, I think I think um, a year ago in that episode, in episode number 723 that you were on, this reminds me of MILP. And oh, like yeah. Models I'd like to program. Yeah, that, that, that was... That, <laughs> <There's I, something. laughs> that was... I, I needed, I remember saying I need to use that and I think I used it for a little <laughs> bit and then I, then I kind of forget, but, um, I'll, I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back for sure. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so a lot of this stuff is really helpful to be it, everything linear fashion. Um, and the complexity would be in the integer variables, the binary stuff like that. That's where things got complex and, and, and things. Now we're diving into, um, uh, quadratic. Um, thing. So your objective is a quadratic function, your constraints are quadratic. Um, and that was that was like the big thing from, uh, I think, a couple versions ago for us was was really doing well in in, in that. And that those types of applications nice. are, are very important in like uh, chemical engineering and, and things like that. Yeah. And so that just to kind of in case people aren't aware, like off the bat, if you can't quickly visualize what that means, quadratic, it, it means that as opposed to a linear relationship. So with a linear relationship, as X goes up, Y say always goes up, or as X goes up, Y always goes down. Um, so you have that linear relationship between X and Y. With a quadratic relationship, as X goes up, there might be a period of time where Y goes up and then it starts to go down or the other way around. It starts, it begins by going down and then starts to go up. So you have a curve um, that can be modeled quadratically with a squared, um, squared variable. And uh, yeah, so obviously there's lots of real world scenarios where you need to be able to model that in order to build a, a high quality model of some real world process. And so, yeah, so I think you were just starting to mention that, that was it with chemical applications? Yeah, chemical engineering is, is, is one in which um, that's like sort of like a go-to way. Um, and prior to that, you would do a lot of um, what, what we call linearization of, of things um, where you would uh, estimate those those you know uh, nonlinear functions with piecewise linear approximations. So instead of like your nice parabola, you would have line 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 that, that mimics it, um, and that is good for some things, but also you lose precision. Um, and the more precise you would like to make that piecewise linear um, representation, the more additional variables you're adding to the optimization model, which makes it runs not quite quite as as quickly. So there is a balance there. You know, precision versus is uh, Precision versus uh, runtime, but now with um, our last version, um, 11, 11 11.0, and what we're getting into in twelve, which is going to be coming out in a few months, um, is just more general nonlinear and what we call non-convex um, optimization. Which the assumption of convexity, which is sort of um, if you think of of, uh, of a feasible region. Um, it's convex if there's sort of no dent in it. <laughs> Take any two points, draw a line between those two points. If every line that you could draw between any two points is completely in the set, then that's a convex set. Um, and if you don't have that, then some of the previous stuff I've been talking about of, of optimization, of mathematical optimization, it just gets really difficult, somewhat falls apart. But we understand that those problems are the ones that people want to solve. So um, the non-convex stuff is something that we've made a lot of strides on. And then just incorporating more nonlinear um, functions that that you can use, um, and and not piecewise approximating them. So not approximating them with a bunch of, you know, sort of um, straight lines that mimic curves, but the actual curves themselves, and impl implementing algorithms that solve those. Um, which um, I'm still getting myself up to speed on those, um, uh, on on what those are doing. But um, uh, but just yeah, being able to solve more realistic problems um, at the speed that people need to solve them uh, is, is what we're looking into, and and what we're trying to improve on um, 
uh, version after version. So um, our, our sort of our bread and butter is that mixed integer program, um, mixed integer linear program, and we're still always in having improvements there. But we are also looking into these nonlinear, non-convex problems as well, which are everywhere as well. So um, so we are trying to become like the the solver for everything. <laughs> um, uh, and And I think one approach that we're trying to take to that that's a little bit different than maybe what some people would think would be our competitors um, is uh, there are some other tools out there that do a lot of local optimization for nonlinear problems. Um, and they don't worry about things like the, the mixed integer portion of, of your decisions. Um, we are still very much what, what, what Garobi is about is, is this global optim, uh, optimality. Like we are provably giving you the best solution for your problem. Um, may take a little bit longer <laughs> in, in some aspects, uh, in some problems, but we feel that that is something that is, is super important. Um, I think I gave a, an example last time of um, if you're a major airline and you can reduce your fuel cost by 1%, that's massive. Um, if you're, you know, just any sort of bigger company and you can reduce costs by the tiniest bit, that's really good. So, so having that global optimality, that's something that is guaranteed with um with uh with how we approach optimization uh is is really important to us and and that's kind of what we want to put into our products nice yeah so handling more kinds of variables like quadratic relationships as inputs or outputs as well as being able to always model globally across mm -hmm. the whole decision space as opposed yep. to just locally um our key elements there for you um so tell us a bit more about why integer variables are so complex to model. So mm -hmm. um, that isn't something that would necessarily be intuitive to me. Yeah, yeah. You would think that if I if I have a a sort of I guess everyone in your minds do it. Let's do a mind exercise. Um, sort of have a, a a two dimensional graph and just put like some sort of polygon on there and make it convex. I just gave you the idea of what con convexity is. So no dents in it. There's, there, there's no dense. So just draw a polygon in your head and then within your head, like highlight the, the integer dots. So where one and one cross, where two and two cross, where one and two cross and everything like that, you put a dot instead of just having like a shaded region. Um, the, the shaded region is what we would call like a relaxation of an integer program. The dots are the actual points that you want as your solution. So um, you might be thinking, well, if I have less points, <laughs> then it should be easier to solve. And it's it's it, exactly the opposite. Um, the way that the um, the uh, essentially the main the way that like the main algorithm works for for solving linear programs, is, it's called the simplex method. And what it does, if you have this this um, polygon in your head, is what it does is it actually because of because of the math behind it. The, the, the optimal solution must occur at, uh, at a point in which two of your, the outside lines meet. So essentially a vertex of your polygon. That's where the optimal solution must be. It can't be anywhere else. It can't be, um, well, I, I'll take that back slightly. Um, it can't be on the inside. Um, you can have multiple optimal solutions if you have two points and then, and then the line connecting them are all going to be the same, are all going to be optimal with the same objective value. So you have your choice in a sense, but it's going to be typically be one of those, those, um, those corner points of your polygon. So because of that, because it's guaranteed that, that, that optimal solution is going to be on the outside there, all of those integer points that you have on the inside are probably not going to be right there. So unless you just happen to have that be the case, now you need to take the, the the main algorithm that that searches that the outside of that uh, of your polygon searches it very smartly. Um, now you have to do something else, <laughs> um, and now you have to break. And the way that that that's done for the mixed integer programming is it takes that problem and it it breaks it into uh, the main the main algorithm that is used for for that is what we call branch and bound. But there's another one I can talk about in, in a second. Um, branch and bound, essentially what that does is 
let's say that you have this polygon and your optimal solution is at where X is 1.5. We know that we want an integer value for X. So let's set up two sub problems, one where X is less than or equal to one, and then one to where X is greater than or equal to two. So you're splitting off of that. You're branching off of that, that variable because we want X to be an integer and it can't be 1.5. So let's say it's either going to be you know, less than or equal to one, greater than or equal to two. And then we, then we solve more linear programs with the simplex method. And you keep doing that until you get to a criteria that says, this is your, this is your mathematically provable optimal solution. So essentially that's part of why it's more complex to have that integer stuff is because you just, you need to run possibly exponentially many linear programs where you're, where, when I mean, when I say linear program, where you don't have this integral integrality uh, restriction. So you sort of let loose the rules a bit, solve, and then you implement more rules as you go. Um, so that's sort of like the, the iterative process that happens. Um, and eventually you'll get to, so eventually you'll get to something that says, okay, all of my decision variables I want to be integer are integer. I have a couple other things that happen about, you know, lower bounds and upper bounds are meeting. And then because of all of that, boom, it's math says that we're at an optimal solution. Right. So I'm gathering here that the fundamental problem when you want to have integers in your model is that you can't do calculus jumping from point to point. Calculus only works mm -hmm. over a curve. And so, less, yeah. I, so I think that's kind of fundamentally the idea here is that you, so you, you come up with ways of artificially constraining things so that you can work over, <laughs> over a curve. Um, mm -hmm. and then by, so by creating these kinds of like relaxing constraints, like you said, mm -hmm. um, and, but doing that a whole bunch of different ways, you're able to kind of, um, to, to view a problem from multiple different perspectives around a point and say, okay, this point, this individual point is actually, uh, is the best from all the possible points out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, um, so something about, like, I sort of said something like, okay, then the math says you're at an optimal solution. So, so, um, so it is worth maybe diving a little bit into like kind of how that happens. Um, so going back to a linear program. So let's say all of your variables are continuous, which makes it easier. Um, so you have like this, you, you're, you're the, the polygon in your head is all just shaded and don't worry about the individual dots, um, in between. So worrying about the corner points and, and stuff like that. Um, that's a that, that's a linear program where all your variables decision variables are are continuous. Um, for every linear program, there is something that's called a dual problem. So it's sort of like um, uh, it's just like another representation that's sort of like a mirror image, I guess, in a sense. If you're maximizing your regular uh, problem, the dual is a minimization problem, and there is. Um, the, the math behind it essentially says that you have your regular problem and your dual problem. If the, um, uh, the, the optimal, um, uh, pardon me, the objective function value for each of those, the, at the optimal point for each of those problems, one going up, one coming down is the exact same value. And that's, that's proven with fancy math and proofs and stuff like that. So the, the, and and uh, to use the terminology, um, the, the original problem is called primal and your dual problem is called the dual. So your primal problem has, an, uh, for, for its optimal solution, has a particular objective value. The dual has the same objective value, but different variables, different, you know, sort of, di uh, I won't go into details of how they translate to one another, but it's pretty easy to actually go between one and the other. But essentially one's going up, one's going down. When they meet, that point in which they meet is your is your optimal solution, and so so that's part of a little bit of the math behind it. How we can how we can say we guarantee is because the, you know people have proven with you know with the fancy math that if this happens, then that's how you know that a linear program is is giving you the optimal solution um, without having to sort of exhaustively search all points and exhaustively search everything. And, and that's how it works with, with you know, and, and when I say stuff like the, the smart math, the smart things that are happening, that's a little bit of a, of a glimpse into how that works. Nice. Very cool.
I am always learning a ton from you, Jerry. You're a great explainer of complex concepts. And uh, yeah, you're great at creating visuals as well. It's interesting as we're recording, I'm not usually kind of closing my eyes <laughs> and imagining uh, polygons, oh, but- I thought uh, you're taking you a nap. It. I thought I was boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on to another uh, tricky technical question for you that, I've, uh, that I'm really curious about is, um, is NP hard problems? So yes, uh, kind of definitionally tricky. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us what NP hard problems are for those of us who don't know what they are mm -hmm. and why we shouldn't just ignore them. And then critically, why things that people wouldn't have even tried, NP hard problems mm -hmm. that people wouldn't have even tried five years ago can now be solved in seconds with mathematical yeah. optimization. So my, my quick little um, rundown of computational complexity is, you know, you may have heard uh, something like, is is P equal to NP? You know, that type of argument. Um, and so essentially what that's talking about is the algorithms to solve problems. What is their computational complexity? So if something is in class P, that means that there is a polynomial time uh, algorithm that will give you, give you the solution. Um, and those are nice. Those are, are easy to, you know, th they run quickly and everything's pretty good. With, you know, that's where you'd like to be. Um, then NP is what we call non-deterministic polynomial. And essentially, there's no polynomial time algorithm known to solve it. But if you're given a solution, you can quickly verify that it's correct. So to actually solve the problem, very difficult, but to verify can be easy. Um, there's then after that is what we call um, NP complete, which is the, the most difficult of the, the NP problems. So if you are able to come up with a, a solution or an algorithm that solves one of these quickly, then you can solve all the other ones in the whole class very quickly. So it's sort of like the domino that, that would make everything, would make life easy for everybody um, in this, in, in, uh, in, in the computational space. Um, but that's you know, probably not gonna happen. Um, but then there's NP hard, which is kind of the same thing, but unlike the NP complete, it doesn't have to, it, you don't necessarily be able to have to verify a solution quickly. So it may be actually very difficult to verify um, if something is, is this, you're asking it sort of, is this solution the optimal solution? That may be hard to, to, to just find out you know, um, on its own. So, so that's where actually mixed integer programming is, is that NP hard. So, you know, you hear about this thing, oh, these problems are so difficult to solve. And yes, they are. Um, uh, but the, the sort of the, the thought is, if it's in this category, don't even try to solve it with an exact solution, which is something that, again, like I say, it's just what Gurobi provides and what mixed integer programming, um, are the solvers like, like us, what we provide is that global exact solution. Um, we need to use heuristics. We need to use approximations. You know, just be and so it's just sort of like a scary word or a scary phrase or something, and it just like turns people away from it and like, okay, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to attempt. Um, and and I came across this with uh, I was doing a webinar um, and I was talking about um, uh, we we have a, a set of of uh, uh, essentially a, a Python package called Groby Optimods, which is sort of prepackaged optimization problems where you just feed some data, it runs, you don't have to worry about any modeling and it gives you an optimal solution. So it's sort of like very cookie cutter problems. And one of those is what we call a maximum weighted independent set. And I won't worry about going into that. You can watch the webinar on YouTube and, and find out for that yourself. Um, but um, I was looking at the documentation for uh, a Python package that that solves it, th that claims to solve this problem. And there's like a line in there that just says, the actual problem, this is, is known to be NP hard. So, you know, you just, you're just immediately better off using approximations, using, you know, whatever, using some heuristic to find the solution. It just like immediately put its hands up and, uh, and said, you know, and this was documentation saying that, and you know, it was documentation for the, you know, for the package itself. So I guess sure, it's not going to say, hey, use other stuff, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and in that webinar, I sort of just like gave it a very small problem of like it's like 
trying to like taking nodes in a network and finding, you know, um, uh, a subset that, that um, I think that covers um, all the arcs. It's, uh, it's, I'm blanking on it now, but again, just watch the webinar. Um, but it gave, it was trying to solve this very simple version of it. And it was just like a 10 node problem and it was giving wrong answers. Like looking at the graph, I could visually see that it was wrong. Um, and it was giving suboptimal answers. So, so be, how could you, you know, how would you think about how this would perform? Like sort of at any type of scale, hundreds, thousands of nodes, like you're trying to do some social network analysis and you're getting, you're running this package and it's just giving you clearly suboptimal solutions. Um, so, so is, there is like sort of this just like NP hard fatigue and, and that sort of, and then that sort of translates into mixed programming of it's a very hard problem. You don't even, don't try solving it with like a solver like Roby because it's just so complex. It's, it's just never going to work. But that was the case like five, 10 years ago. And again, all the stuff that we were talking about before with our algorithmic improvements, hardware improvements, it's just the things that were just like, let's just not even worry about it. You know, oh, we have a, a, a mixed integer programming problem with 10,000 variables and people are scared of that and thinking that's impossible to solve. You never solve that in any type of time that would make sense. Those are being solved in half a second, a second, you know, instantaneously um, nowadays. So it's just, you know, yes, that is true. If I kept, you know, the, the whole thing behind you know, this computational complexity is um, if you expand the, the set of inputs, it, you know, you're, you're growing exponentially. Yes. Eventually you can keep, you can grow the problem such that it'll take Groby forever to solve something that is true, you know, at a certain size. But again, now we're getting to the point with all the hardware, the software and everything where real problems are now manageable. Real problems are now solvable in in real time for some things. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, you may have to concede a little bit of that, that realism to get a little bit of performance um, or something like that, but that's trade-offs you make for everything. You'd make that with machine learning training, you know, uh, um, you know, I want to be able to retrain models quickly. So you'd make some sacrifices there. Um, th things of that nature. So there's always that balance for everything, but, um, but with mathematical optimization, yeah, it's, it, th th it there is this, that stigma and, and uh, yeah, we're we're part of our message is hey, try us again. Um, then you, you may be pleasantly surprised. Um, and well, I, what I will add to that is is there is a difference between uh, you know I think I may have talked about this last time between a commercial solver, yes, Groby. Eventually, you do have to pay and 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 buy a license from us um, if you want to use what we have at the right scale and everything. Yep. That is true, um, but we have the best minds in optimization building that for you. So, so yeah, we, we gotta. They're not doing it for free yet. Um, I ask, they say no. Um, <laughs> but you can use open source solvers, and I think that's a great way to 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 try and solve real problems at a smaller scale and get get yourself going and try and understand. Hey, does this have business value for me? Does this is this going to be helpful? Yeah, you may have to condense things, but it's a good way to learn, good way to get started. And then by the time you would need something like like Garobi, um, your your problems probably have expanded to a point in which um, it is worthwhile to save that. You know, uh, you know, to have something that takes us open source solver maybe days or weeks to run. And we've had that sort of happen where a, a, a now customer or someone who's trying to evaluate us would say, yeah, this with an open source solver would literally take like a week to run. We just click go on it and just came back when it's done. A week later, it would be there. Now it's solving, you know, in 10 minutes, 20 minutes or something like that. Um, something that used to take a day or it would take a day with open source now takes, you know, 20 seconds, 10 seconds to solve with, 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 uh, with a commercial solver like us. So, so there's, so, so part of that is yes, the problem itself is, um, NP hard. It's very difficult. So if you were to attack it with something that is, uh, an open source solver, keep that in mind that there are options, um, past that. And, but I don't want to discourage the use of open source because it is the perfect way um, a great way to to really, if you want to learn, um, uh, 
uh, it, it's a great way to to use um, something that's free to to understand the the value to your business. Um, right now, something like Garobi, um, you can download. You, if you like pip install Garobi, um, you can use a two thousand by two thousand sort of trial license to get yourself understanding. Again, that type of when I, when I say 2000 by 2000, it sort of just comes out naturally to me because I know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, 2000 decision variables, 2000 constraints. Um, uh, so um, so when you think about, you know, the, the number of burrito trucks that you're putting out there and the number of constraints that you're adding to that, yeah, it's a fairly small problem, but but it's it's really good, a really great way to help you learn and understand um, and, and sort of just build a small scale Thing that says that that's somewhat representative of your problem, and then if you need to expand, then then uh, then hit us up again, and, and we'd be glad to to give you free evaluations and 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 help you work through that as well. Um, so uh, so there's a couple of things there that I wanted to, to mention about like if you try optimization and it fails, um, not to, to to think about why it might be failing, and if you are using an open source solver, many of them are really good. Some of them could be good for your problem and you may never need anything like Garobi. That's certainly possible. But once you get at scale, um, there's a decent chance that, that, you, that you may need something like us. Nicely said. And that all made perfect sense to me. The open source you know, trade-offs versus using a commercial solution like Garobi, particularly yeah. when you get to at scale. But the way that you got into this was we started by talking about MP hard problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I do deviate. <laughs> and... Um, so just I wanted to say that because I don't think you mentioned this that um, the NP in NP hard stands for non-deterministic polynomial time problem, yeah. um, and it's kind of another way of saying a very complex yeah. problem uh, because there isn't like you know a deterministic for sure you know you're not going to be able to follow the same path to get the exact same answer every time mm -hmm. um, polynomial meaning things like having quadratic relationships not just uh, linear relationships in there. Um, and so I don't know if you happen to have off the top of your head, Jerry, like real world NP hard problems that, you know, maybe a few years ago, no one would have dared to try to tackle, but mm -hmm. now you can tackle uh, potentially in seconds with Garobi. It's, it's a little bit difficult to say like one type of problem because all of MIPS, mixed engine learning programs, they're all kind of similar in a sense. Um, right. Whether you're using them in supply chain, whether you're using them in in um, finance, whether you're using it scheduling, they all sort of translate to the same thing at some point. You take your decision, you take the the verbal problem again. You algebra, put in algebra. Once you get in that algebra algebraic form, they're very similar in in what you would see sort of written down pen and paper. Um, so it's kind of hard to distinguish that. But one type of problem that or or but. At the same time, uh, operations research folks, they love to talk about sort of um, problem archetypes. So very common things like the knapsack problem is how much stuff can I fit in a knapsack to maximize its utility before I go on a hike? Something like that. Um, another one is the traveling salesman problem. And this is something that you see a lot of, you know, if you, you, you might see some um, some neural networks trying to tackle this problem. You might see quantum optimization trying to tackle this problem, and obviously mathematical optimization. <laughs> what what Groby trying to tackle this problem? It's it's just a very common, um, easy to understand problem. And traveling salesman problem, if you're not familiar, is you have a set of cities that you want to visit. The salesman wants to go um, and sell stuff to each of these cities. What is the shortest path that I can cover all of those, and then get back to my starting place? Um, What's the shortest path that I can take? Uh, a, a common thing is I want to travel. I want to travel to all fifty or say all forty-eight um, uh, state capitals. What's the shortest path that I can take? You know, you don't want to drive from New York to California to Florida, back to Washington. That's obviously not great. You want to you want to find the 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 shortest path to travel. All those things. So that may be sort of like the problem that people sort of go to as like, this is an MP hard problem. And, and, um, uh, it's, and, and it's sort of like the go-to, like this one's very difficult, um, because it is, it is difficult to solve. Um, but, uh, I think now this is where I might have to have to come back and, and do some, some, uh, some research and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, you, you can solve problems that, you know, that the key metric, I guess, or the key sort of like quantifier of a traveling salesman problem is the number of cities. 
And there would be like, if you want to travel, if you want to do like a 50 city problem, like um, even, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, that's something that would be like, oh man, that's, that's kind of difficult to solve. Now we're into thousands and, you know, stuff like that, where it's easily to solve. You can easily solve a traveling salesman problem with, with that type of, 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 uh, sort of size, um, relatively, you know, relatively quickly, or at least, you know, quickly enough for, uh, that makes sense for whatever real application that you're, that you're trying to solve. So, um, that's nice. like sort of like the go-to thing that people like to talk about. Nice. And my last topic area for you, you've been very generous with your time today. Mm-hmm. We've gone well over the recording <laughs> slot that we'd agreed to. Um, but, uh, one last topic area I have for you is around the history of optimization. So it relates to the same kind of thing. You know, you just said that a few years ago, you might've stopped, uh, you know, the number of cities that you might've tried to mm-hmm. fit into the traveling salesman problem might've been 50 and yeah. now it's thousands. So uh, can you stretch back a bit further with the history of optimization and tell us why it initially wasn't popular? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe what some of the first use cases were and how that brought us to where we are today. Like there's sort of two big names um, and I'm, I have it in front of me so I don't mispronounce it. Um, Kantorovich in 1939 and then George Danzig in 1947. Those were sort of two of the, the people who really brought um, linear programming, as I was describing um, earlier, brought that sort of to the forefront. Um, But um, Danzig gets a little bit more of credit. He's sort of like the name because he was the person who invented the simplex algorithm, what I was talking about before, going from uh, corner point to corner point in a a polygon. Um, But using that algorithm to solve a linear program sort of brought the linear program as an important planning and decision-making tool um, uh, around that time. So sort of like the um, one of the first uh, applications of that is uh, whenever if you ever go to an, a, like a, an OR operations research like site or something that about about mathematical optimization and there and, and it's like here's here's our first example. It more or less is going to be something called the diet problem. And um, that was a, a very small problem. Um, that was developed um, for, I believe, the U.S. Army to help. Um, what is? How can I feed troops? How can I feed like, um, uh, you know, a battalion or something like that? Um, how can I feed um, that group of individuals, making sure that they have the nutrition that they need, but at minimal cost? So that was sort of one of the original um, uh, applications of of linear programming uh way back when um things like the and i talk about the integer programming sort of was um developed more or less um in the mid 50s um with Danzig and and other folks as well who were adding to that um so around that time was when you know a lot of the th- initial theory was developed the problem was once you try to get past that real simple problem which um was nine constraints and 77 variables. Um, once you get, so that's a very, 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 very small problem, exceptionally small. Once you get sort of past that, the, the computational sort of power just did not exist. So fast forward to maybe something like the seventies was when we actually started to get a little bit more of the information or a little bit more of the power to actually solve some of these slightly larger problems that were still relevant to businesses, still relevant, um, but we actually be able to, to, to solve them um, in, in any type of, uh, in any type of speed that would make sense. You know, it's not taking days or weeks or, or years, but you know, like something that you can actually use. Um, and a lot of these problems were for like, um, uh, oil and gas companies for refineries was sort of one of the original sort of adopters of, of linear programming. And they were actually very, uh, very, uh, much, uh, into funding this type of research in order to, um, uh, in order to push forward the, uh, the theory and the technology and everything like that. So essentially what the main bottleneck was, was computational power. And that is something that is very sort of mirrors a lot of um, sort of why it took so long for deep learning to, to also become the powerhouse that it is today is because 
the, uh, you know, for, for deep learning, you know, the, the, the data wasn't there that, that we needed to exist to, to, to really use it, but the, the computational uh, part wasn't there as well. Enter, you know, enter GPUs and all of a sudden, boom, this, the, this whole new thing sort of just explodes. And, and that's sort of what, um, what mathematical optimization kind of hasn't had just yet. I mean, obviously I've been talking a lot about how the CPU and performances and, and all that stuff has, has, um, uh, has really increased over the last, you know, 20, 30 years and stuff like that to, to have problems that are actually, that were you know, they've never been able to be solved. Now they can be solved in, in minutes and seconds. Um, but there, but just like, we, there wasn't like a, a new technology that was, that was sort of came on, came on the scene to really spur it. Um, like, like GPUs did for, for, for deep learning. So, um, so it sort of just got kind of like lost in the shuffle a little bit. It definitely found its, its niche, um, uh, niche is kind of like too narrow of a word, I guess, but it has its, its, um, you know, uh, early adopters, you know, so I mentioned supply chain a lot. That's the, that the sort of one of the big ones, um, that became an early adopter to mathematical optimization and, and showed a lot of business, uh, value there. Um, but then once you get into like the nineties, um, and, and things like that, where is where, um, a lot of people started putting, um, effort into, the algorithms and and really um, improving that as well. So there's some groundbreaking research um, that really sped up that part of it, um, and just sort of uh, going, you know, sort of uh, adding to that, sort of time over time over time, and and then uh, Groby um, uh, came on the scene in uh, 2008. Um, from a company, one of our um, competitors called Cplex, um, which is owned by IBM. They were, you know, th a bunch of people there, um, inclu including the, all three of our founders um, uh, were at Cplex and and um, making awesome investments advancements from in, in the LP algorithm space. Um, but then, then just decided like, hey, we're getting a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, slow down. We, we want to take a different, uh, approach. So that's where Garobi came in. So, um, our three founders decided to, to start a new company where creating the, 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 uh, the fastest, most powerful, uh, mathematical optimization solver that we possibly can became, became the top priority. So, um, so yeah, it, there's a lot of early opt, you know, early adopters from a theoretical, theoretical perspective saying this could be really cool. Just, just the the computation stuff wasn't there. It got there a little bit. Oh, people are like this is kind of nice, but again, let's solve a little bit. Let's solve more realistic problems. Again, sort of entered that that same bottleneck of of computational um, inefficiency. And now that things have been steadily increasing, from people making the algorithms better, for people making the hardware better. Um, again, now we're actually at a point where, over the last few years, really seeing. Uh, businesses solve awesome problems that are at the scale that they need. Nice. Great recap there. Uh, it's awesome that you had prepared notes so you could speak so uh, specifically about uh, dates and people, significant events. Fantastic. Uh, no doubt there will be more mathematical optimization in the future as more and more people learn about it through things like this podcast. And as the solvers become more and more efficient, Amazing episode, Jerry. I learned yeah. so much from you yet again. Do you have a book recommendation for us again this time? Sure. Um, last time I dropped some, hey, let's let's get into optimization uh, as one of the books I, I cheated and used too. Um, this one's going to be a little, little bit different. I am uh, a child of the 80s and 90s. Um, so a, one of the big things that a lot of people had in the 80s and 90s was um, some sort of Nintendo um, system. Um, so uh, one of the, the book that that uh, that I'm going to highlight now is um, called Ask Iwata. From uh, so um, Satoru Iwata was uh, a legendary CEO at Nintendo. Um, was given a lot like he's sort of given a lot of credit for um, just uh, fostering like a a very creative environment. 
and that allowed developers and people that work there to really um, push the boundaries of like imagination and things like that in, in game development. So he had, it sort of goes into his leadership and management philosophy. Um, so sort of emphasizing things like um, empathy for your workers and customers and really trying, like really putting you, your heart and soul into, into what you're, you're, you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to create. Um, and, uh, things like innovation, um, risk-taking and, and how that's very important for companies to thrive. Um, it's, it's just something that I found to be extremely, um, interesting and something that, that, um, that I sort of took to heart a little bit in terms of risk taking, um, particularly it's kind of just like coming to a position like this um, at Kurobi was what was a little, you know, I could keep working in a consultancy, doing a lot of cool projects and stuff like that. But, you know, being able to take a risk and, and, and start, you know, really getting a, a message out to data scientists and the AI community about optimization. Um, I thought that was a big risk because it could have gone nowhere <laughs> and I could have not be on podcasts like this, talking to um, awesome people like you and and everything like that could have just tanked. And and uh, then I'd be back to where I was. But um, uh, so, so I sort of took that to heart. So um, I think that could be a, a great thing for for anyone else who's interested in the history of Nintendo um, and and things like that, uh, could be interested to to dive into that book. Great message there, and uh, it's funny. I'm also a child of the '80s and '90s. I remember <laughs> one of my earliest memories. I must have been four years old on a bus. Uh, I remember I was leaving kindergarten to go home on a bus, and I was sitting next to some kid. I have no idea who he was, but he talked about how soon there was going to be a super <laughs> Nintendo. Yeah. And it blew my mind. And that, that might literally be my earliest memory. <laughs> that I still have. Well, that's a good one. That's a good one to have. If you're going to, uh, if you're going to keep one, that's, the, yeah, that, that is kind of like my first, <laughs> my, my first, some of my first memories is I have an older brother who, who, you know, if you have older brothers, they tend to, uh, pick on you a little bit and, uh, beat you in things mercilessly and getting beaten in video games is one of my earliest memories. Um, but, uh, He's not going to, he's, I don't know if he's going to ever hear this or anything, but I'm significantly better than him now like, <laughs> for a long time. Like I, I have, I have significantly outpaced him, but, um, uh, but, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, all in good fun. And, and, uh, yeah, those types of, uh, yeah, <laughs> those types of, uh, fun playing games with, with people and stuff like that is something I look, uh, very fondly back on and, and, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely miss those times a little bit of hanging out on the couch. And oh, and no. uh, playing games together is, is oh, no. one of my favorite pastimes. Yeah, I do miss uh, you know when we were all kids and everyone just had all this time and you could just <laughs> phone a friend up and hang out and you just knew that they were at home just yeah. looking for something to do. Uh, and you don't have that as an adult. I guess we have retirement to look forward to. <laughs> that is true. Um, in the meantime, between listening to this episode and retirement. Jerry, where should people be following you to get your latest thoughts? Sure. Uh, probably uh, LinkedIn is probably the best uh, the best way. That's where I'm most active because a lot of the stuff that I put out there is also through um, through Garobi as well. So um, and you can stay connected with all of the cool advancements that I was talking about with nonlinear capabilities and and all this other stuff. Um, you can definitely find out all of our awesome events. Um, if you want to go to Las Vegas, if you're looking for a reason to go to Las Vegas, we are holding a summit um, in in uh, mid September. It's going to be great. I'm going to be hosting a data science track, so you can uh, sort of uh, we can sit down together and and have fun with with all these hands on stuff. Um, if you're interested in that, and you'll be getting a lot of updates through LinkedIn on that, uh, I'm also active, somewhat active uh, on Threads, um, but uh, by and large, uh, LinkedIn's the way to the way to get to me. Or just email me; <laughs> that's cool too. Um, uh, or LinkedIn message. You know, uh, I'm happy to chat with anyone who's interested. Nice, and yeah, I just checked out uh, the Garobi Summit coming up September 19th and 20th yep. at. Uh, not just anywhere in Las Vegas, but the Win Encore Resort, which is, as far as I'm aware, the premier uh, <laughs> spot. It's uh, it's the only place I've stayed in Vegas, and it was a really cool, beautiful spot. Awesome. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, we're super excited about the whole event. Um, and I was talking about NVIDIA. They're they're going to be coming to speak there as well. So um, so you can hear more about the relationship between uh, Garobi mathematical optimization and the powerhouse known as NVIDIA. So uh, nice. it's going to be actually, a, registration is is about a tenth of what it usually would be. It's uh, you know re registration is two hundred to three hundred dollars depending mm -hmm. on when you sign up. You know before or after September third. Uh, but typically I'd expect to be going to a conference in Vegas, the win encore, it'd be about 10 X that. So yeah, it does look like a great, uh, excuse, uh, and you wouldn't have to, to, to bug anyone in your company for too much budget. <laughs> exactly. Uh, to yeah. head out there and check it out. Very nice. Cool. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you so much for taking all the time with us today. It's been awesome. I have learned a ton and yeah, can't wait till the next time. Awesome. Uh, it sounds good, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to more conversations. Whew, what a brilliant, well-spoken guy. In today's episode, Jerry filled us in on how mathematical optimization is prescriptive, such as helping with business decisions relative to ML and stats predictive nature. And he talked about how mathematical optimization is the ideal tool for the job whenever there are many real world constraints to factor in and you'd like to maximize or minimize something. He talked about how you can learn about optimization hands on yourself using his Jupyter notebooks and uh, online courses. We've, we've got links to all of those in the show notes. Um, he talked about how GPUs are not ideal for optimization, but state of the art CPUs like the 72 core NVIDIA GH200 allow optimization operations to run 23% faster and use nearly half as much energy. He talked about how the latest and greatest mathematical optimizers can handle quadratic inputs and outputs, and how NP-hard problems like the traveling salesman problem and the knapsack problem can now, in some cases, be handled in seconds by mathematical optimizers, while just a few years ago, we might not have even attempted to tackle such complex problems. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Jerry's social media profiles, as well as my own at superdatascience.com slash 813. Thanks, of course, to everyone on the Super Data Science Podcast team, our podcast manager, Yvonne Siebert, media editor, Mario Pombo, operations manager, Natalie Jaisky, researcher, Serge Massis, writers, Dr. Zara Karshe and Sylvia Ogwang, and our founder, Kirill Aramenko, for producing another outstanding episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we are very grateful indeed to our sponsors. You can support the show by checking out our sponsors' links, which are in the show notes. And if you are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can get the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Otherwise, please share, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. But most importantly, just keep on tuning in. I'm so grateful to have you listening and hope I can continue to make episodes you love for years and years to come. Till next time, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.